بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I am Ayman Ibrahim, a member of the SRI group Today we are going to discuss the first topic in this little course and that would be observational studies We can divide all studies into two major types that is observational and experimental um, On what basis you may ask that would be on the basis of assigning the exposure in experimental studies we do assign the exposure we bring a, a group of people and then we give them some intervention we put them under certain exposure and then see what happens in observational studies it's quite the opposite we don't we don't intervene in those patients we just watch them we collect people and we see what happens to them without our intervention you see there are many types uh, of uh, observational studies and we are going to discuss them all today. Uh, first of all, we're going to begin with, the, with case reports and case series. Very simple, really. The case report is basically an objective report of a clinical characteristic or outcome from a single clinical subject. What does that mean? That means we are basically just making a report on one patient. This is an example, a 35-year-old man with Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. So we, we uh, as, as a physician, I might see this patient uh, and I'm very interested in him. And therefore, I write a report and I publish this report so other people can better understand the disease. In case series, it is very, very similar, but instead of one patient, we have a group of patients. So, for example, we can just make a report on all patients with MERS in a local hospital. Okay? So, again, in case reports, we find a there is a patient that we find very interesting. And then we write a report about him. In case series report, or sometimes just called case series, we find a group of patients who are very interesting and we like to write a report about them. Okay, we're done with the first part. Now, we, there, uh, the, the second part, or the second type of observational studies is called cross-sectional studies. What does the cross-sectional study do? It basically studies the presence or absence of disease or and other variables in each member of the study population or in a representative sample of the study population at a particular time. It looks like a very long definition, but we're going to understand it if we break it into smaller parts. So first of all, we're studying the presence or absence of something in either each member or in a sample, representative sample, at one point in time. Maybe an example will help us understand this better. If you want to study who in the community has Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, so we're going to either pick a population or we're going to ask each person in the population, do they have the disease or not? Or we can test them, do they have the disease or not? So we basically want to know that now who has this particular something and who doesn't have it. Okay. So we have a population of sorts, and we want to see, do they have a disease or not? So we just find out if they have it or not. That's pretty much it. Uh, an important point, though, is that all this happens at one point in time. So we're not following these people anywhere. We're not looking at what happened to them in the past. We just care what is wrong with them now, at this point, today. Do they have the disease? Or do they not have the disease? So the cool thing about cross-sectional studies is that they can calculate prevalence. So we can safely say after such a study, how much, what is the percentage of the population that do have the disease? But it cannot determine the temporal relationship. There are better studies to do that. The third type of uh, observational studies are case control studies. Now we're really getting into the meat of this thing. So case control studies basically identifies a group of people with the disease 
and then compares them with another group without the disease. Okay? So here's an example. We find a group of people with Middle East Respiratory Syndrome and then compares them with people without Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. This helps us better understand the disease we're going to study. Of course, it's almost always retrospective, so, so keep that in mind. So to understand this a little better, let's look at this. So imagine we're going to study, a, uh, let, let's create an example, okay? Imagine somebody just came in and told you that 90% um, of people who have disease A, okay, are smokers. How did they know that? Okay. How did he know that? Um, well, he made a case control study. He created two groups, people who have the disease, people who don't have the disease, and then measured how much of those who have the disease are exposed to the outcome that is in his study, smoking. Okay. So basically, in order to make a case control, we now make create two groups people who are diseased people who are not and we see what happened to these people before they have the disease are they exposed are they not exposed to a certain exposure are they smoking are they not smoking are they exercising are they not exercising this will help us really understand better the relationship between the exposure and the outcome that as a disease help us understand the for example smoking with this disease okay so we call this type of study a retrospective study why because we now live in the present but everything that happened to these patients the fact that they are diseased or not the fact that they uh, smoked or not uh, this all happened in the past okay so we're looking at what happened to their we're looking at the history basically at what happened to them in the past and we're trying to make sense is that it's a really a relationship between what they did and, and the disease they got. So in case control studies really cannot assess incidence or prevalence. That's because they do not really represent the population. We have made these groups up based on having the disease or not having the disease. So the correct the incidence or prevalence in these groups really are not what we would find in the general population. It can help determine causal relationships, but it's not the best study to do so. Uh, we see better studies that perhaps can really give us more solid evidence on the causal relationship. But it is useful for studying conditions with very low incidence or prevalence because we can just collect all those people who are ill, even if there are very few, and put them all in the same group. So that kind of helps us if the disease is not very prevalent. Okay, then we have the cohort studies. Number four. So, in order to uh, in order to create a cohort study, a group of those who have been exposed to a risk factor are identified and then followed over time and then are compared with a group that is not exposed to the same risk factor. So, let's take an example we want to follow participants who smoke and those who do not smoke to measure incidence of lung cancer. Somebody would say, oh, so it's like the same as the case control study. No, it's not the same as the case control study because in the case control studies, we already have people who are diseased and then we see what happened to them in the past. Were they smoking or were they not smoking and all that kind of thing. But now, we actually have a group of people who do not have the disease. Some of them are smoking, some of them are not. And then we follow them over time to see which of them are going to have the disease. So let's see a figure to understand this a little better. Here we have a population at risk. What do we mean by having a population at risk? That means none of them have the disease already, but all of them may have the disease in the future okay so all of them are healthy okay all of these people are healthy but they may be sick in the future 
So basically, we want to study these people, so we divide them into two groups. People who are exposed to a certain exposure and people who are not exposed. And then we follow them. We follow them over time and we see who of those people develops the disease. Okay? So, for example, if you want to study the uh, prostate cancer, if you want to make a, co a prospective cohort of prostate cancer, we should make a population of, of people who do not have prostate cancer, okay? But And also a population that can develop prostate cancer in the future. So, for example, we cannot really include any women in the study, right? Because they cannot develop prostate cancer. And then we divide them into people who are exposed or non-exposed. For example, people who are smoking and not smoking. You know, smoking is a terrible risk factor for many, many diseases. So, people who are smoking, people who are not smoking. And then we see in the future who will going to get sick and who is not going to get sick. Okay? And then this helps us in a way that this exposure may increase the risk of the disease or it may decrease the risk of the disease, right? So we call this particular type of cohort a prospective cohort. Why do we call it a prospective cohort? Because we have divided the population, uh, we have the, chosen the population and divided it into exposed and non-exposed in the present, and then we follow them in, into the future. So when we divide people now and follow them into the future, this is a prospective cohort. The opposite of that would be the retrospective cohort. The retrospective cohort is basically the same thing. You see, this is exactly the same thing. But now, instead of um, instead of dividing the population now, all of this just happened in the past. And now we're just looking at the records or looking at what happened to them before we begin the study. Um, perhaps some comparison will make this clearer. A prospective cohort, in a prospective cohort, the cohort is assembled now. Now we choose the population, now we divide them, in the future we follow. In retrospective, sometimes called historical cohort, the cohort already happened in the past. The, the people already um, had developed their disease in the past. And we are looking at their data, maybe their hospital records, and we see who, which of them was exposed and which of them was not exposed, you know? So the whole process of having the exposure and having the disease already happened. We're just looking at the history and we're trying to make, uh, you know, to understand uh, how this, uh, the, the exposure may be related to the outcome. Another difference is that, is that in prospective cohort, we measure patients' data in real time. So we're measuring patients' data as they have the outcome. But in retrospective uh, cohort, we look at the patient's records. Another, uh, and I think this is an important advantage of prospective cohort, is that we can measure anything. We can measure really anything. If we want to, um, for example, understand the relationship of a certain blood value, and what does this, uh, how does this relate to the outcome, we can measure that blood value. But if we're doing a retrospective cohort, we have to see if somebody already measured that blood value, and maybe nobody did before. And if they didn't, we will not be able to make the study. So a prospective cohort is a better design, although it's more expensive and more difficult. But it's better because we are measuring peop all people uh, kind of in the same way, and we measure all people um, for the variables that we want instead of just looking at what happened in the past and what other people have measured in the past. I hope uh, this makes sense. So, as a general rule, just something to keep in, uh, to keep in your mind at all times, is that cross-sectional studies occur at a certain point in time, most likely now. So, a cross-sectional study occurs now, a cohort study goes into the future, and a case control study goes to the past. All right. Thank you very much. I hope this kind of cleared up some confusions for you. And I hope it didn't create new ones. So best of luck, my friend.